All right, Lakina, hey. I am here. All right, all right, we're all right. We're welcome back to our two of Second City Sports Zoom style, right here on Zoom. I'm Lakina McGee. You can follow me on Twitter at Lakina McGee. I'm Sid the Kid. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Sid Kid Eddie. Once again, at Sid Kid Eddie. S I D K I D A zero. S I D K I D A zero. All right. So uh, before Spiro Diaz, you know, you know, we're gonna hopefully he'll join us a little, a little bit. But uh, we'll talk about the NFL draft. Um, what do you think about about the Bears and what they did? I mean, they, they went with Cole Komet. I mean, we all kind of expected because they were gonna go tight mm -hmm. end, but. For for me, it sort of sounds like they kind of follow their own playbook. I mean, they have about like twelve tight ends on their roster right now, <laughs> so it seems sort of counterproductive that they would that they would draft him. But uh, I mean, listen, he had uh, Antoine Whitfield Jr. still out there on the board. I mean, yeah, guys like that. So, but then they end up with Jalen Johnson, who went healthy because he's had injury issues over at Utah. But he is, you know, he has been first. He's a two time first team All Pac twelve corner at Utah. So. You know, like I said, when he's healthy, he's really good. So, what do you think about the Bears' uh, draft? It looks like they went uh, defensive secondary uh, in the back end of this draft because uh, we all know that Prince Amukamara was the free agent. They let him go, so you had to replace him. And also, you had to find a safety for Eddie Jackson uh, again. So, they had to go in that direction there. Now, Cole Komet, like you said, it was a no brainer. They need an athletic tight end. I think he's going to provide them an instant spark on offense. Now, how much that uh, will Bears head coach Matt Nagy use him? We shall see, but hopefully he'll be a part of the bigger picture in, in the game plan. As far as the other draft picks are concerned, as I mentioned, they went with defense and a defensive he heavy, especially in their secondary, which it needs a lot of help because of the departure of those uh, players I just mentioned. So, uh, like you said, they went according to script, and let, let's see if, they, if most of them will make the team and they can stay healthy. So, it's going to be, as we talked about last week, like, it, 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 we're not going to have a traditional all season where these guys will get to know each other and get a team camaraderie. Training camp is going to be so much important, that much more important now, whenever that is that they start on time and they're delayed about a week or two. So training camp is going to be important, not just for the best, for, but for everybody else around the National Football League. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, it's going to be interesting to see how all these rookies will be able to kind of uh, mesh and get to know each other because you got all – now all the teams – oh, yes, even the Saints, because I know Sean Payton was not very keen on it initially, but I think he realized that, okay, let we got to do something. Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, darn it. <laughs> ah, silly uh, Zoom. I mean, hello, live Zoom, folks. But, uh, yeah, I mean – I, I like some of the picks that the Bears made. I mean, like I said before, they got they got Travis Gibson, another who's an edge rusher from Tulsa, Daryl Darnell Mooney from Tulane, Arlington Hambrett from Colorado, and also Lashavius uh, Simmons, who was the other second seven rounder. They had they had two seven rounders. So yeah, I mean it's gonna be to see how all these rookies, you know, from all these teams are gonna be able to kind of mesh because there there are no workouts. You know, these facilities are still closed. So it'll be interesting to see how these coaches and all these new players are going to be messed, especially also, and I don't think people want to say it yet, they're going to renegotiate their contracts. Yeah, it's, yeah, and I couldn't agree with you more there, Lakina. Now, and also, too, let's keep in mind that the rookies, I'm sure they got in their playbooks by now via Zoom or via their emails or whatever, so they, they had to work off of that. But as I mentioned before, training camp is going to be that much more important now because, you know, OTAs are not happening, at least in person. Yeah, they do your workouts via Zoom style. So uh, it, it's going to be a, a major adjustment period. Yeah, so um, I, I'm wondering, though, though before, before the Spiro joins us, uh, who, who are kind of like the steals and sort of like the ones you're like, really, really? Did they pick that guy? Who are kind of your sort of those, those standouts? Oh, <laughs> it's really, really tough to say because, like I said, it was a deep wide, it was a deep class for wide receivers this year. I thought the Bears was going to get one of those wide receivers, and uh, it didn't happen unless I missed something. You know, mm -hmm. um, New New England. I thought they were going to pick a, a, a quarterback. Uh, they didn't do it. Uh, they went with uh, other other needs on the team. So I was kind of looking at, at looking at the at those two situations there. Yeah, I was kind of surprised that the Bears decided not to go quarterback because I, I kind of feel like, you know, as they say, you, you keep drafting and drafting your quarterback until you find somebody. So I'm a little bit surprised that they didn't go that route. Uh, I mean, 
you know, Jake Braun, he was he was gone by the by the time the Bears got to, to it. So I don't know if that was really mm-hmm. intentional or the plan, but it, it's sort of one of those things where you say, okay, what's gonna what's sort of the plan here? I will say, uh, it's interesting. You know, Justin Jefferson ended up going to in the going to Minnesota, that's definitely going to kind of like spruce up that defense. We talked about that, that offense, I should say, because, you know, with Diggs, you know, being traded. Mm-hmm. So I think, mean, you know, a lot of the sort of the, the teams that you kind of like fill the needs, but Jordan Love, you know, that's going to be, <laughs> that's going to be an interesting uh, a twist there because <laughs> I can only imagine what Aaron Rodgers is feeling like right now. I mean, they didn't draft – speaking of not drafting wide receivers, the Packers definitely didn't draft any wide receivers. Mm-hmm. So I'm wondering what Aaron Rodgers' mindset is. I know that they – I know that the Packers drafts are probably – are preparing for the future, but at the same time, though, you got a quarterback that wants to win. So I'm wondering, like, what's, what's kind of like his mindset? <laughs> now, I agree on one hand – with pack with the Packers drafted Jordan Love because you have to uh, protect yourself for the future. Because let's be honest here, as, as I said last week, you're not sure about that offensive line of the Packers. And number two, they went away from the game plan of let Rodgers chuck it up all the time last year when they had to balance the attack of running the football with Aaron Jones. Now on the flip side, I think Aaron Rodgers will use this as motivation. Now how far as they take him to help the team win, I'm not sure. Now, I'm not going to sit here, sit here and say that Jordan Love's ready to take over because he's clearly not ready to be that guy yet. But if you're the Packers, you do have the draft for the future because you never know. But uh, And listening to some, some of the experts and some of the uh, Packers fans up there in our, our, our northern state in Wisconsin, um, many of the fans were not happy, but you got to think that they – uh, they have to look down the road, and you, and you have to. Yes, they have other needs that we talked about on the show the last few weeks. Uh, mm-hmm. Wide receiver was one of them, and, uh, uh, and another pass rushes to go with the Smith brothers is another one as well. So I, I, I kind of get where some people are coming from, but I don't have a problem with this pick right here, even if he doesn't turn out to be the guy. So what? He's an asset for somebody else. That's how this works. Well, and, and listen, the Packers have done pretty well with quarterbacks lately. I mean, a lot of people mm-hmm. thought that they would have to wait a while before after Brett Favre, Aaron Rodgers. You know, hey, look at that rest. He's been there for three years. Yeah, so maybe you know it'll be the same thing here with Jordan Love. Maybe he sits for two or three years, learn from Aaron Rodgers, and we'll see what happens. I know the Bears. I know if you're a Bears fan, you don't want that, but <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I would say maybe Arizona. I think they 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 uh, filled up a lot of needs. I think Baltimore was another one that filled up some needs. Um, let's see. What's I think Detroit did pretty well. I know some people were surprised at some of their picks, but I think they did pretty well addressing some needs. Um, the the, the charge. Here's another they, surprise. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Here's another surprise pick I didn't bring up. Philadelphia taking Jalen Hurts. Yeah. Uh, um, uh, be the backup uh, behind <laughs> Carson Wentz. I can only imagine what those Philly fans sounded like on their sports talk stations. Oh, wait. <laughs> but um, I'm not saying that Jalen Hurts should. Will, will be that guy from day one. No, not not a question. Carson Wentz, when healthy, is an MVP candidate. But I think this was another smart move by by the uh, the Eagles organization. Yes, Carson Wentz has been peanut brittle these last couple of years. So uh, you have to protect yourself. It, just in case he goes down again, uh, Jalen Hurts, as we saw last year at Oklahoma, playing in their pro-style offense, those shadows were taken off from his days at Alabama. Uh, and I think he'd be ready to say, but not to be the day, day one starter, no. But he, he'll have some experience under, under his belt. Hopefully it doesn't have to come come to that if you're an Eagles fan. But I do like that pick. He's a little bit more athletic than the Carson Wentz. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and uh, joining us right now, uh, Sporting Nuggets, a little, showed a little gray in the beard there. <laughs> Somebody we haven't done on the show in a while. Uh, you, can listen, you can watch him on CBS Sports, on Turner, with T, uh, uh, TNT, and on, also NBA TV. He covers college hoops, NBA, and NFL. Spiro Diaz, Spiro, how are you? Hi, Lakina. Yeah, this is my, uh, my quarantine look. Get a little grayer. <laughs> Get to uh, dress casually every day, put a baseball cap on, and uh, just hoping that this thing passes soon, like everyone else. Yeah, we all are. Sid, you got, you got to, you know, what's your first question for Spiro? Uh, hi, Spiro. This is Sid here. Nice to meet you, and really enjoy your work. Um, uh, Thanks. Going Sid. through your bio, 
Yeah, no problem. Going through your bio last night, uh, don't want to start off this interview on the sad note, but, you know, 2020 has been a crazy year, especially in the world of sports. And you were the voice, radio voice of the LA, LA Lakers during the back half of Kobe Bryant's career. Uh, he passed yeah. away back in January. Give us your quick thoughts on uh, the legacy of Kobe Bryant. Well, first of all, it still seems surreal to think that he is that he is no longer with us, that he's passed on. Um, you know, to 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 talk about Kobe in those six years where I had the, the privilege of, of being able to cover the team, travel with the team, get to know him a little bit on a personal level, um, really, you know, made it hit home even more. And, you know, we all saw how affected people were emotionally. Uh, once the news broke, people that had never met him before. But, you know, this city, especially here in L.A. and Southern California, really grew up with him. And so the bond between Kobe and this region, uh, really hard to describe. And those of us who, again, were fortunate enough to know him, uh, really can see the kind of person he was out of the spotlight because there was so many layers to Kobe. We all knew how great a player he was, all-time great player in NBA history. But to know him as a person and as a man really took your, your understanding of, of who he was to a different level. And, you know, what really hit it home for me, what really made it hit home for me was in his post-playing career to see how happy he was, how content he was, to finally be able to put his playing career off to the side and really devote himself to his family, to his wife, Vanessa, and to the four kids. He was so content you know, to be their spokesman, to be their, um, their supporter after they had given everything and supported him uh, during his playing career for so many years. And, uh, you know, then we learned about the other seven people who perished in that crash, all amazing people in their own right. So just such a, such a tragedy on so many different levels. And uh, you just hope that the families of the victims can, can eventually find peace and, and some comfort. And what makes it even sadder now, do is your that, time with the no they, i think no the, just real quick so, uh, the what makes it even sadder is that today would have been gia's 14th birthday so yeah, it just I saw yeah that. just keeps getting sadder, I saw that. sadder and sadder go ahead sid yeah during your time with the lakers of course uh they won the back-to-back -back championships in, in all nine mm -hmm. in 2010. i heard a story that you gave one of your championship rings to your father if i have that correct please t tell our audience that story behind that well, my father is my hero, like so many of us who were fortunate enough to, to grow up and know our fathers. Uh, you know, Greek immigrant, classic story of, uh, of the immigrant, you know, coming from his home country. He came here by the Mideast with like 25 bucks in his pocket, uh, really sacrificed his life for our family to give us a better life and worked so hard to get into the restaurant business and, and, and open something up that would be able to support us put me through college. And so, you know, my one goal was to, in life was just to make him proud, you know, make him feel like what he did um, was for, for his children and would really give him satisfaction. And so when I got that first championship ring, I mean, I couldn't wait to give it to him, but he still has it. So uh, shows it proudly in their house in, in Northern New Jersey. And uh, every time I go home, it's just, it's a nice little connection that we have. Uh, he was able to be in L.A. for game seven of that 2010 finals with Boston. I made sure as soon as that series went to a seventh game, I said, you got to get on a plane because this is a once-in-a-lifetime experience. We were able to enjoy it, experience it together, that post-party celebration, to have him there. You know, it was just uh, – took, took the whole experience to a different level. Love that. And it's such a, such a sweet – I didn't know that story either. So, Sid, nice nice taking by you. Yeah. To kind of – kind of investigated like, reporting by Sid. Yeah, he is. He's really good at that. He's really good at that. Uh, to kind of lighten it up here, uh, Spiro, uh, what do you think about all this you know, this, this whole thing you know, with the pandemic going on in an NBA? I mean, LeBron had to debunk a rumor a couple of days ago saying that, you know, there, there's no truth to the rumor that – the season's canceled. That they're gonna, they're trying to work on. There's another uh, report that came out that from Brian Woodhouse has said that they are trying to work out some type of very eight variations. What do you think they're gonna do? And do you think they're gonna even gonna finish the season? 
I'm still optimistic at this point, and I think for a couple of reasons. First and foremost, I think we have to remember what happened in September with China and the whole Daryl, Daryl Morey t- a tweet and what a catastrophe that was financially for the EPA. I think, well, you know, we've heard different reports of how much money the league lost in deals that were canceled by companies in China. So I think financially, the incentive is very, very strong to wait until the last possible minute before they would have to make really a, a, an unthinkable decision of canceling the season. So I think they are going to wait to the last minute. I, I think now we're starting to hear reports that this um, scenario in Orlando is starting to pick up some steam. You know, initially the bubble city was Las Vegas. We, we know about the hotels that they have at the ready there uh, who would love to house these NBA teams and staff and everyone would have to be there. Now we're, we're starting to hear that Walt Disney World in Orlando could be, you know, maybe even more of, a, of an option. So you know, I, I still think at this point the goal is to get some semblance of a regular season in and then obviously do what you have to do in the postseason. Who knows what that format looks like? We've seen different scenarios thrown about. But, you know, I, these rumors and stories that we're hearing now, I kind of equate to, you know, pre-NFL draft where people are just throwing out a bunch of scenarios and noise. Uh, let's not forget, you know, these news sites have to fill content 24-7. So uh, my my – thing to the fans would be don't believe everything you hear you know i think those decisions and and conversations are are happening behind closed doors right now and um i'm I'm optimistic you know call me crazy uh, but i'm optimistic that they're going to have some semblance of the season spiro ditas of cbs sports joining us on second city sports zoom style uh spiro um you worked through at many places throughout your career nba nba tv and nfl network uh growing up uh, was was this your uh, is this what you want to do? And if so, who are some of your favorite broadcasters that you like to that you were listening to growing up? Oh man, this was my dream job, literally my dream job, you know. And I, I think it for me, I got the bug. Man, I was, I was young. I was probably just into my teenage years where I, I started becoming infatuated with what the announcers were saying when I'd watch a game on TV or listen in the car on the radio. I grew up in northern New Jersey, huge diehard Nick fan, uh, New York Giant fan. Those are my two teams, the NFL and the NBA, were my two favorite sports. Uh, and so my heroes growing up, you know, certainly Marv Albert, growing up on the East Coast, anywhere really in the country, Marv was the voice of the NBA. Uh, but Mike Green was, was really someone who not only I enjoyed, but someone who I tried to kind of pattern my own style around because Marv – so great, but such a unique sound. There wasn't really much you can steal from Marv without sounding like you were, you know, completely trying to steal his style. Mike was someone who had such a great gift for calling a game. His descriptions were incredible. Um, He had a great voice. He had that great on-air presence. And radio was really my first love. And when I was growing up in the late 80s, early 90s, that's when Mike took over uh, Nick's radio. So, uh, you know, there were times I, were, I was home, but I would go into my, my mom's or my father's car and turn the radio on just so I could catch Mike. You know, this was pre-internet where you can get a call online. And so, you know, full circle years later, when I get the Knicks job in 2011, you know, the great part about that, not only the job itself, but a chance to really travel with Mike, spend time with him on the plane, on the road, really pick his brain. Uh, I've just been so fortunate to have the opportunities I've had and to get the chance to to learn from guys that were literally my heroes growing up. So believe me, I mean, there are days where I really try to, you know, remind myself how fortunate I am because I think, you know, a lot of times in life we, we tend to forget and not appreciate as much as we have. And uh, I think that's one of the things that we, we should try to do now with everything going on. You know, I think we're reminded of how fragile our lives are, how fortunate we are and, you know, this is a good time to really hit the reset button and be thankful for, for all that we have in our lives. Well, we're thinking, well, we're thankful for broadcasters like you, uh, Spiro, because I remember a couple of years ago, us in Chicago, you, you know, were part of that magical run that Loyola had. And I've been wanting to ask you this, sure. what was that, what was that like? I mean, you know, it's just, it's just like, you know, Sister Jean and, you know, that, that whole team kind of just captivated the city. Sister Jean, oh my God. I mean, that, no matter what I do for the rest of my career, you know, if I had to make a list of like the top 10 sports events, that, that's going to be on my top 10. 
it was such a, to me, that whole story just completely typified what the NCAA tournament is. You know, you get one of these obscure teams, and obviously Chicago, big city, but Loyola, you know, in recent years, didn't have much of a history at the NCAA tournament in March Madness. So, you know, just to have them upset, you know, beat Tennessee the way they did advance, and then you have Sister Jean. I mean, that was, it was incredible. I mean, it got to the point where every time we showed her on camera, you know, in those moments after that upset over Tennessee, I literally had to had to catch myself because I found myself getting choked up. You know, I, I she reminded me of my grandmother. You know, the the just her her unbridled joy for those kids was it's amazing. I mean, even now I get a little choked up seeing it. So, I mean, you know, we had her on camera. Uh, we we were able to interview her at the end. Roz Gold on what a had such a great interview with her in those immediate uh, moments after that upset win, and it was. It was crazy, so emotional, but that that right there, that story with her and Loyola, to me, just that, that's what the NCAA tournament is. That's what makes that that tournament so special. You know, the the authenticity, the raw emotion of that tournament is really unlike any other sporting event we cover. And it's, it stinks that we were able to get that this year. I mean, you know, Sid mm. and I talked about a few weeks ago with all the stories of the various teams. I mean, Penn State, Rutgers would have went for the first time and like over the yeah. – almost yeah. 30 years. So it, it's just sad that we, we didn't get a chance to see that because, you know, you just share with the Loyola team. It's just unfortunate. Yeah, it is. And, you know, we, we're already with, with our colleagues at CBS. We're talking about how special the tournament's going to be next year after it's been taken away from us like this. But for those kids that you mentioned, those seniors, those upperclassmen, some of whom are graduating, some of whom are moving on for whatever reason, they're not going to get that opportunity. And that's, that's tragic in a lot of ways. But you know, what can you do? You know, it's in, in some, it, it may sound cruel and harsh, but in some ways it's kind of an early life lesson for them that, um, you know, life is not always fair and you have to kind of deal with the punches as they're thrown. But uh, I just hope that a lot of those kids that missed out this year will get an opportunity next year. As you mentioned, Sparrow, you worked with the, with the New York Knicks many years ago. Fast forward now to 2020. Uh, they have, they're, now they have changes within their front office of, uh, they missed out on some players via draft or, or via free agency over the last few years. Do you think they'll ever get that situation turned around? Because they haven't had a winning season in the last five, six years. Oh, man. That's it. That's the, uh, that's the eternal question. I feel like we've been asking <laughs> that question since, uh, since Patrick Ewing was traded uh, in the early aughts. Um, you know, being at the Garden those three years for me was, was really eye-opening. You know, it's – I grew up, like I said, a diehard Nick fan and going to the Garden as a kid, watching every single game, you know, the, the, a team that was a perennial championship contender. And it's just, it's amazing to me how within the NBA confines where there's a salary cap and presumably every team is on an even playing field financially, how one franchise can struggle for such an extended period of time. Um, you know, I, I know James Dolan gets a lot of flack in New York uh, from the media. And, and, you know, look, when you lose that long, it's, it's, it's deserved in some ways. But, you know, he's really swung for the fences. He's really uh, – he's tried to, to bring in people that he thinks can have success. Phil Jackson, you know, when he made that hire, you know, hindsight being 2020, when the, when the move was announced, everyone was on, all about that. You know, we thought Phil could be the visionary to bring some of his magic that we saw as a coach to the front office, obviously that, that didn't pan out. Um, but, you know, I wish I had the answer to that question. All my Nick buddies, my, my Nick friends uh, in the Northeast are, are still asking me those questions. But the one thing I will say, the three years I was there, when Lynn Sanity happened, Sid, you know, it, mm -hmm. it was nice because that old energy was back in the garden for the first time. And that was really, really cool to see that because it had been so long. But, uh, you know, they had a tough summer free agency last year. I know they put a lot of eggs in the uh, – and their basket with the draft obviously didn't work out with Zion Williamson, KD, and Kyrie. But, um, you know, all you can do is reshuffle the deck and swing for the fences again next summer. Yeah, yeah don't worry about it, Spiro. We're, we're feeling it here in Chicago with the Bulls, so, and they just have <laughs> the, the new personnel within their front office. So we'll see what happens there. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I, I will say that the league does need the Knicks and the Bulls to be good. It's been so long. You know, and you guys remember, man, Knicks Bulls. I mean, those rivalries were so great, and I think there's oh, been something yeah. missing with the NBA. There's been something missing with the NBA with those two franchises down as long as they've been. 
Well, you know, a few more, couple of minutes with Spiro Adidas here on Sexy Sports Zoom style. I actually wanted to ask you about that because have you been watching The Last Stands? Uh, and I think they are going to talk about those Knicks, those Knicks battles <laughs> in the 90s, I'm sure, later right. on. And do you see them maybe perhaps doing like something similar with those 2000, 2010s Lakers teams? I hope so. You know, we, we just found out that Kobe, um, you know, we actually were there. So we saw the cameras, but now it's become public that Kobe's last season in 2016 was documented. So I think a lot of us are hoping that eventually they'll put out a documentary like we're seeing now with The Last Dance. Uh, I haven't missed a minute of it. I, I've, I have a TiVo and I've even watched a couple of the episodes multiple times uh, just in case there was something I missed. But you know, reliving those Bulls years, even though they were heartbreaking for me. I mean, your team just <laughs> crushed our soul every summer, every spring. So that part has not been fun. But, you know, to, to take that stroll down memory lane, different year of the NBA that, that really, I think a lot of us grew up falling in love with the league because of the style of play uh, has been really, really neat. But, you know, one, one observation, I can't believe that MJ still has – the, that bitterness towards Isaiah Thomas. I think that was something that was eye opening for me after all these years and after everything he's accomplished in his career, still seems very angry with Isaiah. We were talking about it earlier. I mean, you guys are all, you guys are all in your fifties. I think you're going to be 60 next year. Come on now. Y'all hug it out, please. <laughs> yeah. It's too much. Come on. They need to hug it out. But I, you know, Jordan's got to be the one to take the first step. I mean, we've all heard the stories of Jordan, you know, keeping Isaiah off the dream team. And Isaiah's apologized. I mean, I thought he apologized even recently before this thing happened. But uh, MJ, you know, for all his greatness, he is a stubborn, stubborn man. That's for sure. It's an interesting it's result, though. If they decide to do do one of those Lakers teams in those during the two thousands, are we going to be hearing like are we going to be seeing anything new or maybe something we already knew? Yeah, I think you'll always see it, you know, because, you know, as the years go on, our memories get a little dulled, you know, and I think once you relive it, it just brings back such a flood of memories, like not only what was going on with the team, but what was happening maybe in our own lives, you know, as we were experiencing those years and those championship moments. So I really hope, I really hope that they, they put something together because as you guys know, those Lakers teams, man, they were never short on entertainment. You know, there was bickering in the locker room, you know, the Shaq Kobe thing was, uh, was really kind of in its infancy and developing into something that became, uh, you know, almost like a soap opera. So I think they, they may have even more content than they had with this Bulls documentary. Might be 15 parts. Pick... <laughs> yeah, exactly. Go ahead, Sid. I want to pick your brain on the NFL, which you call the games for for CBS. Uh, one of, is not the biggest move of the offseason is Tom Brady um, being kicked out of New England and signing the free agent two-year contract with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Does this, that move make them a, a, a Super Bowl contender, or do you think that Brady is just playing on his career? Do you think he has anything left in his tank? Uh, yes to all of those questions. Um, okay. First of all, I'm super excited that he decided to leave New England. I think that, that story kind of reached its climax. I mean, there was nothing really more he could accomplish there. You know, uh, the six Super Bowls and just, I mean – career that I think will be unparalleled maybe ever in the history of the sport. I think this move energizes Tom. It certainly energizes that franchise in Tampa Bay. But, you know, think of what a great story this would be. You know, potentially the greatest quarterback of all time going to the losingest franchise of all time and turning their fortunes around. I think it's going to be an unbelievable story. Um, now, you know, to, to have Gronk join him down in Tampa, I think adds a little layer of entertainment to that. Mm -hmm. And I don't think there's any part of Tom Brady's being that would allow him to just play out the string. I think he's going there motivated and to prove to the NFL that he can win without Bill Belichick. Because I know they said all the right things when they parted company here a couple of weeks ago, but there's a little part, I think, deep in the pit of each of their stomachs that wants to prove that they can win without the other. Very similar to, to Kobe, you know, when, when he was separated from Shaquille O'Neal. Everyone said that Kobe couldn't win without Shaq. And he was driven from that point forward to prove everyone wrong. And I think there's a little part of Tom Brady that wants to do the same. Yeah, yeah, speaking of the AFC, can't wait. <laughs> yeah, speaking of the AFC East, uh, we know, know there's going to be a competitive division for the first time, probably since Brady got drafted there in 2000. So, and I think <laughs> right. you did a couple of their games last year. The Miami Dolphins, 
I like their new head coach and Brian Flores. I think that team is headed mm. in the right direction. Now, as far as playoffs are concerned, I'm not so sure about that yet. But what do you think about the direction of the Miami Dolphins? I love Brian Flores. We had a chance to do a couple of Dolphins games, like you said. We spent a good amount of time with him. Um, man, everything about him makes you want to rally around your coach. You know, grew up uh, in, in a, maybe the roughest section of New York City in Brownsville, Brooklyn, same town where Mike Tyson grew up. Um, just a really hard upbringing. And he is such a hardened, determined guy. And I think if you think of everything that the Dolphins experienced last year, you know, the, the first two weeks of the season, they got blown out. I think the, first, the, the worst two-week stretch of any team in the history of the league, I think they lost by like 100 points. And people are already talking about Brian Flores, you know, maybe being in over his head. Then all the tanking talk, you know, people were saying the Dolphins were losing on purpose, got off to that 0-7 start, finally broke through. But to see that team from that to the end of the season, how well that they finished, I think is a testament to Brian Flores. I think he is determined to have a very long, successful coaching career. And I really think now you're starting to see that franchise molded in his personality. And I think that's a very, very good thing. I give, I give their owner, Stephen Ross, a lot of credit. He's got a lot of money, but he really believes in hiring the right people and empowering them to do their job. And I think the hierarchy that they have in the front office uh, with Brian Flores as well is, uh, is a very sound foundation that they've built. And keep in mind, one thing about Brian Flores, people forget, he started in New England's scouting department. So not only can he coach, but I think his eye for talent is something that's underrated. And I think you're going to start to see that now with the players that they've drafted, not only this year, but last year as they start to pan out. And they end up getting to us. So I didn't think you had to take too much for them. Yeah. They end up getting their guy. So that's, exactly. <laughs> you got to love how that worked out. Um, you know what, Spiro, we got to do this again. I mean, this has been so much fun. Uh, mm-hmm. We just want sports again. I think we all, we all can agree. We want sports again. This has been too boring. <laughs> yeah, I think, we're, I think we're all done. I haven't put a pair of real pants on in about seven weeks. I want to I wanna get back to work. I want to put a suit on and then, you know, get back on a plane and start calling action in person. But, uh, you know, like I said earlier, you know, if nothing else, I think this will make us appreciate what we have and how, how impactful sports are in all our lives. It really allows us to make a living and, you know, have some really, really great moments. All right, bro. You, you you definitely kind of told, told some of the stories and some of those moments. And, you know, we got to get you again soon. So this has been great. For again, sure. Spiro Diaz from CBS Sports and Turner. Thank you so much, Spiro. We got to do this again. My pleasure, Lakeen. That's it. Thank you so much. Thank yeah, you. Thanks, you have a good one. You guys be safe. Thanks, guys. You too. Be safe. We'll talk soon. All right. Sorry, absolutely. Spiro. All right. As uh, Spiro departs. Okay, Sid. Speaking of a speaking of a guy that kind of went through um, sort of a interesting background, uh, Mark Eversley, who is now the new Bull GM. If you if you read Mark Spears's um, column on the undefeated, th- he has a pretty interesting upbringing. Both his parents were from Barbados. He was born in London. Ended up moving to Canada. You know, played basketball at uh, Urbana University. Not 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 Urbana in Illinois, but Urbana mm-hmm. University in Ohio, which is in IA school at the time, ended up going, uh, ended up, you know, being hired as a junior uh, salesman at Nike, worked his way up, and then ends up going into the NBA, you know, most loosely with the Sixers. And you listen to his presser. I mean, he lost his brother, unfortunately, when he was very young, as he was starting to kind of work through the ranks of, in Nike. I, I think the Bulls made a good decision. I think this shows that AK, this is going to be a new, there's new sheriffs in town. There are new people coming in. What do you think? Uh, I'll look at it from two aspects. One, not to get too deep with it, but we all have challenges and circumstances and, and adversities that we all have to overcome in our lives. I don't care what, excuse me, what situation you grow up in. It's not where you come, not not basically where you come from, but what you do with those opportunities. And so you have to attribute that to Mr. Eversley. So congratulations for him getting the job, first of all. It is well-deserved. I hope he does great things here. Uh, number two, I... We see more and more in our workforce, especially in the sports world. Uh, hopefully, the NHL, if you're listening, you can pick up on this. It's not just about the person's skin color that you hire, but they also have qualifications as well. And, and the NBA has always been an inclusive league to a lesser state, the NFL as well, and Major League Baseball. But the NFL, um, the NBA rather, has been in the forefront of including other uh, other 
ethnic groups and African Americans in particular because we're 70% of the league as far as players are concerned. And so uh, the, uh, the Bulls are moving in the right direction. Yes, it looks nice, not to be offensive here, it looks nice on paper, but uh, just hopefully, you know, they're allowed the same rope as their white counterparts to do their job and giving equal opportunity to do their jobs. I, I, I just hope that is uh, given here in Chicago, which I think it will. I just hope that it, it turns out to be um, going back to not, not of course, back to the glory years of the 90s, but to get this thing back on track, to be, become a respectable organization again, a respectable franchise, because it hasn't been that way over the last uh, several years, especially since Michael retired from the, uh, retired from the Bulls in 98. Yeah, and they actually a couple of days ago they actually was the anniversary of D Rose's tearing his ACL. I did I did not need to see the uh, the replays. I know you avoided two Sid. So I mean, yeah. this is, <laughs> Mark Mark he Mark changed has, the franchise and he changed his career. So yeah, I know absolutely. he's still playing now. He's still playing now. I know he, uh, he was playing for the Detroit Pistons uh, this season. Yeah. Actually, looked good. He was a borderline All Star, but. Well, when that injury happened, you just knew that, of course, all the drama and the behind-the-scenes stuff followed, which made it even worse. Yeah. You won't get into all that. You no. <laughs> people lift it up themselves. But but uh, it really changed from the Bulls could have stolen the championship until now being a mediocre team at best be, because of the injury. The Bulls pulled all all the eggs in one basket to uh, in, in, into Rose, thinking that this hometown kid, was going to bring the Bulls back to prominence. If he wasn't injured, he probably could have done it. Because yeah. He, uh, he, they, the Bulls left him to that number one pick. And remember, it was between him and Michael Be- Beasley. It was it was an obvious choice that the Bulls would, uh, um, they were, they were going to take Rosen. I'm, I'm glad that they did. But the injury just changed the course of his career. You know, he's still playing in the league, but it really changed the trajectory of that franchise. Let's hope that uh... – a- AK and Mark Eversley can uh, definitely help kind of shape it because at, at Mr. Eversley, you know, he has a, a good background. I mean, you know, he worked with Steve Nash when he first came to the league and also Vince, Vince Carter as well as some other players currently. He, you know, worked under uh, Elton Brand, who's become, who's become a, a top GM in his own right. So hopefully this will lead to probably getting some of those top three agents to come to Chicago because as you see from the last dance, Unfortunately, the the Bulls have had that, that that bad reputation. So, hopefully, this will this will turn the corner a little bit. Yeah, I'm rooting for those two gentlemen both. So, hopefully, they can um, bring the right players in here to make the Bulls getting back, uh, getting the Bulls back to where they're supposed to be as a a contender for championships, and, and more importantly, be a res, uh, being re, a respectable franchise. This has been so much fun, Sid. I mean, it feels good not be able to have to do all the talking for the cha- for a change. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I like what we do, but like you say, if you bounce your stories and ideas off of other people, uh, this this is what makes what we do that much fun, you know, because we can sit and talk all day, which is good at times, but, you know, you start running out of ideas. You regurgitating the same things. It, 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 it then so does silly. not become fun. Exactly. So, Oh, uh, but I, I can't complain. This has been a great episode this week. Uh, thank you once again to uh, our, our friend of the show, Miss Alyssa Berger Media from um, the Chicago White Sox and NBC Sports Chicago, and thanks to uh, Spiro Diaz from CBS Sports as well. Uh, one of the best play-by-play men in the country. Uh, check him out on CBS during the NFL season and doing college basketball. I'm glad you asked him the question about college basketball because that was one of the questions I had down on my notepad. I don't know if you can see it, but it's already dropped right down. But, but I was going to Very ask great about, school. Uh, Very great school with that uh, composition book there, Sid. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Shout out to the dollar store. They still sell them. Yes. Uh, but uh, but I, I was going to ask you before you did about the uh, missing out because he's one of the voices of, of March Madness. So I was going to ask him, like, where, how disappointing uh, was he that, that he didn't get to call the games as you brought up uh, the, the Loyola tournament uh their run for the tournament a couple of years ago we like like we talked about many weeks ago looking uh we missed out on dame potentially having that run bradley here yeah. in chicago when they won their first tournament game the the final line the first time in about five six years they got back in the tournament so because they won a game or two uh, going on the surprise one so it's unfortunate that in 2020 we didn't get to see that uh, in college basketball and like i said Rutgers. i mean i think Rutgers, their team was built to probably go on a yeah. nice little run and um mm-hmm. 
Dayton, a lot of people thought, people probably felt Dayton could have went to the Final Four. I mean, Obi Toppin, you know, Anthony Grant, who was yeah. there during those uh, Florida teams that I feel like don't get their due, but again, that's a whole other episode. Right. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, yeah, it, this is unfortunate. Uh, you can tell, I think Spiro feels a way like, like the rest of us do, that we, we did get a chance to see those big runs. Who could have pulled up an Oleola-type run, but yeah, I mean, this has been a great episode, and we'll, we'll dive deep into, you know, Eversley, and maybe, well, will Jim, will Jim Boylan still be the coach by the time we reconvene next week? We'll see. I mean, they should be kind of be accelerating here. Yeah, and, and we'll get into this more next week as well. May, and maybe baseball is coming back. Maybe the NBA is, is coming back. It's not if, it's not if, but when. So we're still going to have a lot of stuff to talk about, and hopefully we can bring up more guests to help us uh, uh, navigate through through this um, through this uh, trying time. But we're all going to get through this together. And so uh, even though it's been a challenging time, uh, it's been fun doing this, Lakina. So I, like I said, I love doing this. This is what we uh, got in the business for, to do stuff like this. And we're just going to keep it going. Yeah, absolutely. We have to. We got to. Exactly. You know, we got to make, listen, this is what we do in Chicago. We got to make it do what it do. So. Exactly. So uh, you follow me at Keena McGee on Twitter, at Keena underscore McGee on the Insta. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at SidK80. Once again, at SidK80, S-I-D-K-I-D-80, S-I-D-K-I-D-A-0. You can read all of my articles on weareregalradio.com. That's W-E-A-R-E-R-A-G-A-L radio.com. And you can listen to the D and Davis show and our show, Second City Sports uh, War on Anchor, that kicks you over to Spotify and wherever you download your podcast. Have podcasts, make sure you download D and Davis the Sports Show, D and Davis to Flip, and D D and Davis the Sports Show, and D and Davis to Flip, and Second City Sports as well. Make sure you check out D and Davis their latest interviews they had with Dion Miller of ABC Seven Sports Chicago. Hope we get on this program soon. And Luke Canells from Fox Thirty Two Chicago Sports. Those were great interviews. Please check them out on our podcast pages, and you can check them out. On YouTube as well. Make sure you search for the Dean Dave Show on YouTube. All right. So for Sid, I'm Lakita. We'll see you guys next week for more Second City Sports Zoom style right here on Zoom. Hopefully, we'll have another guest or two. This was a great show today. Mm -hmm. And uh, stay safe out there, guys. And Illinoisans, wear your mask. It's mandatory now. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> stay safe, guys, and wash your hands. Stay at home. Holla. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> oh my gosh, I, go. I love it. Okay.